Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm finally getting settled in after the Mind Under Matter Campout Festival, finally starting some uh, recordings again and getting caught back up. One of the wonderful benefits of doing the festivals is I I reached out to a bunch of my past guests to check in with them, see what they've been up to and, um, and see who had any new books or anything like that that's been out recently. And one of my guests, I believe, you, Jim, you might have been in year one of the Here We Are podcast. I think it was like seven years <laughs> ago that we talked. I'm a founding guest. Yeah, you probably don't even remember me. And I, I remember. Much I remember it was you didn't have the beard. I think Shane because you were, may have changed. And you aren't you aren't in Arizona anymore, are you? I'm partially in Arizona. I'm in okay. I'm at the University of Montana now, mostly, and that's where I'm sitting right now. But uh, in in winter time, cleverly, I go to Arizona back to Arizona State University. Oh, that is very smart. <laughs> I got to work out something like that. Well, uh, you know, yeah, I do have a PhD, so, you know, <laughs> I got it figured out. I had to get a lot of education to get that smart, I guess. Um, and uh, so Jim Elser is, is, is someone who I've, I, I follow all my old um, Here We Are guests on on Twitter and, and his his account in particular is is one that I've kept up with. We don't talk about environmental issues as much on the show um, as as I'd always like to, even though I've been working with the One Health Initiative more and more uh, recently, as some of you listeners may be familiar with. But um, so we're, we've been including more and more environmental things and reached out to Jim. He has a new book out that just came out last year. Is that correct? That's right. Phosphorus. Uh, Phosphorus. Yeah. Phosphorus. Past, past and, and future. future. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, congrats on the book. Thanks. And um, and can you give the audience a little bit of your background? Let's let's assume even if they did hear you on the show seven years ago, that they <laughs> may not have sure. remembered every detail of that conversation. Uh, great. Yeah. So I'm a limnologist. What is that? That's a, sort of a freshwater oceanographer, I guess, is a shorthand way to say it. I study lakes, mostly lakes and streams, but especially lakes. And I study especially the cycling of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon in those systems and how they are, those cycles are influenced by organisms like plankton, microscopic organisms you find in lakes. So, um, which naturally, as I mentioned, brings us to phosphorus. Phosphorus, it turns out, is a center of a lot of interesting biology. All people have phosphorus in our bodies. Um, and phosphorus is essential for growing food. It's also a major driver of water quality problems that we have around the world because it's a fertilizer, right? It's fertilizer for crops. It's a fertilizer for algae and stuff when it gets in the water. So yeah. um, that's what the book is about. It's sort of bringing all those ideas together. You know, I always joke that nitrogen has a better publicist or something like that. And everyone knows about carbon. Uh, yeah. And, you know, for, you know, God, carbon, good Lord, right? You can't get enough of it uh, in the news. Uh, but phosphorus, you know, really, really, really essential and important element. That's uh, in the middle of a lot of things that people care about, but not people just don't have much awareness about it. So I was inspired to write a book, introduce phosphorus to people, um, and uh, luckily joined by my colleague Phil Hager at Lancaster University to co-author it, and it came out. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that's a that's a fantastic point because it's it's kind of worth remembering um, just how knew a lot of our knowledge about how the world works. It, it wasn't that long ago where uh, people would hear about this new oxygen stuff that's been discovered and be like, why, why is that important to know anything about? And it, it sometimes takes a little while for things to be disseminated and get into the public sphere. And, and uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't, uh, I, I know very little about phosphorus myself. We, we had, we had, but you a, told me you read the book. So I didn't you know read the book. I downloaded the book. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> well, all right. 
I, I I skimmed it. I skimmed it. I I had a, a one of my guests, Tracy Finara, uh, who um, I think she's maybe still in Sarasota, Florida, but was at the time, and uh, does a lot of ocean science stuff. And and had her on years ago to talk about the red tide. Oh uh, yeah. Um, you know, happening in in the Gulf, and it, this was this was uh, several years ago when they had it. I think 2019 when they had an especially bad year yeah. and um, and I think I've had her on since talking about uh, similar issues with uh, uh, issues with yeah, I, I was raised on the Mississippi and in, in Wisconsin yeah. and um, you know, fertilizer getting in yeah. from the Mississippi and, and you know, you, you have farmers that are, thousands of miles away that aren't really thinking about what's going into the river and traveling down into the coast and how that's impeding the oceanic life there yeah. and and the fishing industry and all of those quite literally downstream consequences. Sure. Yeah. So um, first off, what is phosphorus? All right. Phosphorus is a chemical element. It's um, like nitrogen is a chemical element. Carbon is a chemical. Iron is a chemical element. What is an element? That's another more basic. An element is a unique configuration of, of uh, subatomic particles. Mm. So, and, um, so phosphorus is the element that has 15 uh, protons in its nucleus. Okay. And it has an associated similar number of neutrons and then, and then some electrons spinning around that. Um, so, you know, so carbon has 12. So those are the, so, the, but it's just it, periodic table is a counting game. If you look at mm -hmm. the periodic table, you just go up by ones. Those ones are the protons that you're going up by. And so, um, phosphorus is the chemical element that has 15 protons in its, um, nucleus. And therefore, because of that has a certain mass, has a certain charge, has a certain affinity for other elements and can do certain things in chemistry that our other elements can't, which mm. is sort of also, you know, the thing with why we use carbon, why you use nitrogen, why there's oxygen in your body, all those things come together biochemically. So phosphorus is an element, which is kind of an important thing to know because for sort of a good news and bad news story, the good news is that um, you can't destroy it. So we'll always have it. Uh, the bad news is we can't make any more. <laughs> So mm -hmm. what we have is what we got and because it's made in the stars during supernova explosions. So we could make more phosphorus, but we'd have to create a supernova explosion. Oh, and that would well, probably be a bad, a bad move. Um, so so we're sort of have the phosphorus, all the phosphorus we'll ever have, we currently have. Um, but on the other hand, we're not going to get we're not going to run out of any in the sense that it's going to go away, like burning fossil fuels. Right. The energy contained in a fossil fuel. Once you burn it, right. the energy gone. is gone. Right. It's yeah. not gone. It's still in the universe, but it's just going right. to heat. Right. So it's not useful anymore. So that's a great thing about phosphorus is that it can be it's retained. Right. You can always re infinitely recycle it, for example. And you can always just keep it in circulation if you want it to you can use but it. It's yeah. It becomes quite a bit harder when you, you're going from, you uh, say, you, you mine this stuff, you put it in fertilizer, and then it gets washed out into the ocean. Well, yeah, now, that's the uh, a basic problem of entropy as well, right? So randomness and things getting dispersed, right? So over millions and millions of years, biological processes in the ocean sort of organized phosphorus and organisms because they need a lot of it. That phosphorus got buried in the bottom of the ocean, got geologically transformed into phosphate-rich rocks that eventually got tectonically uplifted or exposed somewhere where they can be mined. And so biology over millions and millions of years concentrated the phosphorus very much for us, made it easy to extract, relatively speaking. But now, now we've got it up here and use it, then it gets dispersed again. And now you have a problem, right? Because now it's everywhere rather than somewhere. Right? right. And that's the problem we have is that it used to be very highly concentrated in these mines. There still are a lot of phosphorus in mines available. Um, but after we've used it, it's very hard once we've let it go into the environment where it causes havoc. And we've discussed red tides and eutrophication, algae blooms and such. Once we've let it out there, it's going to be very hard to get it back because now it's everywhere. Right. It's diluted. 
Mm. Um, and how much you said that there's phosphorus in our body? How much phosphorus? Or a pound and have? a half. A pound and a half. <laughs> a pound and a half in an average person. I thought pound. there'd be like a pinch. No, I actually. But a pound is a pound and a half is a lot. Like you would, you would, if that was cocaine, you'd be doing a like a life sentence. A pound and a half of phosphorus in your body. Um, when I talk about phosphorus in the public, I often give a talk about phosphorus in the form of a quiz show. And um, the first question, one of the first questions is, how much phosphorus is in your body right now? People get this sort of worried look on their face because they don't know the answer and they have no idea and they don't even know what phosphorus is and somehow yeah. it's in their body. And they don't know how much. It's kind of an alarming thing. Um, so a pound and a half, it's in your bones for for vertebrate animals like us. Um, ah. Most of our phosphorus is in our body, in our bones, in a, in a mineral called apatite, A-P-A-T-I-T-E, um, calcium phosphate mineral that forms the bulk of our bones to, and gives them their stiffness and uh, hardness. Um, and then, you know, you have some other stuff in your nucleotide, nucleic acids, your DNA, RNA, and the membranes of your cells have phosphorus in them. But for vertebrate animals, it's a bone story. Okay. But it's even in our DNA. And how... Yes. They, so, <laughs> so I, I guess... I'm a little confused. Where is so going back to these phosphorus mines? Where where is a lot of the phosphorus concentrated in the world right now? Morocco. Morocco. Okay. Morocco has the biggest phosphate mines. The known reserves are they have about seventy five percent of the global known reserves of phosphate rock. Okay, China so, has a big chunk, and then we're third, I think. So so and and it's it's. If people do know about phosphorus, usually they would associate it with fertilizer. Yeah. And and this is this is all a very modern thing. But where does the phosphorus in our bodies come from? From your food. <laughs> okay, so so just historically there was just always so there's always just like a little bit of phosphorus. Well, there's a natural the phosphorus that, cycle. Yeah. So there's phosphorus in rocks everywhere. Those rocks are being weathered um, chemically, that phosphate. Phosphorus has phosphate is being weathered, brought into soil, and accessed in soil by plants, right, naturally. Yeah. And then the phosphorus is now moving into the ecosystem. Insects and other animals will eat that, right? And then they get their phosphorus from eating that. And then carnivorous animals will get their phosphorus from eating other animals. And dead things fall into the soil, get broken down by bacteria and fungi. And that's where they're getting their phosphorus from. And you have this whole cycle going on. A lot of that cycle just stays in the living things and back and forth, back and forth for a while, but slowly moving into the soil. And some of it's leaking out, leaching out, going downstream in the watershed into the rivers, eventually in the ocean, right, where it circulates again and again and again, right, and some of that sediment's out, um, and eventually it gets, gets turned into rock. So there's a natural phosphorus cycle, and that's in, what's happened is that humans have accelerated and amplified that natural cycle right. by about 400 to 500 percent. But by, just with industrial farming? By mining, and by mining phosphate rock in, the, in support of agriculture. And yeah, to to uh, to restore the depleted phosphorus. Yeah, in the because if you soil. just grew crops on soil right. without fertilizing, you you would be pulling that phosphorus out much faster than it's naturally weathering. Mm -hmm. And so, to, and so high yield agriculture really requires fertilizer application because there's just no way for the natural cycles to keep up with the rates at which we're removing phosphorus or nitrogen from croplands. So you have to put it back. Or else your yields will decline. I love whenever I get an opportunity to bring a new problem to people's uh, <laughs> well, awareness. Well, okay. Hopefully, eventually, we'll move this because to a we solution don't have space a, as well. Uh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But a lot of my listeners are like, I don't have enough problems in my life. I yeah. don't have enough to think yeah, about. Yeah, here's something new to do worry have, about. Do you have a few <laughs> more things you can file on? All across America, because I know you have a vast listening audience, <laughs> uh, people will be lying awake tonight. Thinking about, uh, about phosphate phosphorus. and yeah. what's going on with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, well. I mean, it's 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 a really cool the the shallow dive that I've that I've taken into it already. It it, it made it seem um, it, 
far more fascinating than um, uh, than I think a lot of people would would first suspect. What what's the history of it? So the the book is called Phosphorus pa- Past and Future. Can you break down a little bit of the history of uh, some of the science and discovery of uh, phosphorus? Oh. Well, go back. Uh, the, the phosphorus was the first chemical element that was actually isolated and purified by, by humans. Mm-hmm. Um, that was done by a German by the name of Henning Brand, who was an alchemist. And um, back before science or in proto-science, alchemy was sort of a proto-science. And so, uh, you know, alchemy was all about finding the philosopher's stone, right, which was this substance that could transmute um, base metals into gold, right? Into precious metals. That was the idea of alchemy. And the idea of alchemy also was that if you had the philosopher's stone, you could also um, have the secret to eternal life, right? So so people could live forever or something like that. So everyone was searching. But also the- you could arm kingdoms and stuff like that, which was pretty valuable. Yeah, that's right. So there, had, yeah, the philosopher. If you had the philosopher's stone, you had you were, you were in the driver's seat. I guess. Right. Um, so everyone was very serious about finding a philosopher's stone. The alchemists were out there doing all kinds of wild things, and Henning Brand was one of these uh, people. And I don't know how or why he got onto phosphorus or onto the path that led him to phosphorus, but I think it was because of, and well, well, cause I'm about to talk about urine and so how he, yes. got onto, how he got onto urine. So I guess urine, I guess it got into urine because it was some kind of vital substance, right? So the mm-hmm. vital vitality of a living person, right? Was somehow still flowing in urine or something like that. So he got into urine and um, others were also working with urine um, yeah. as alchemists. Well, it's like, why wait? We're humans. We're, we're so great. Why are we yeah, wasting so all this, of this, this wonderful vital stuff, stuff must be in us somehow. And therefore, maybe it's coming out of us, I guess, in, right. in urine. So maybe that's why you do it. So he went through a very complicated series of distillations, mm-hmm. heating urine uh, the very high temperatures to drive off the water and drive off the your, the nitrogen stuff and whatever else is in there and got it to elemental form. So normally phosphorus is associated with uh, four oxygen atoms in the, what's called phosphate. Hmm. But in to get in an elemental form, it's just the phosphorus atoms themselves, right? And then, so he did that by a very complicated process that if you go online, you can find the guy who actually tried to do this reproduce this in his garage oh wow and by like t- when people by try to make and old swords or whatever. And, and all this stuff and it's a very i think he got in trouble with his homeowners association but um <laughs> in any case this is what henning brand did and what mm. the remarkable thing about it when he did that when he had the elemental form it's very re- reactive with atmosphere because it's oxygen in the atmosphere and so oxygen mm. in the atmosphere reacts with the elemental phosphorus and it gives off a glow and this was like mind blowing, of wow. course. Wow, right? you must have so, been famous. Oh, yeah. So I did it. I found finds. He would go around yeah. then and circulate around the countryside or to <laughs> other rich benefactors and, and do Just this demonstration. This he would he would do this demonstration and show this material that would glow naturally, you know, light without fire, right? Is essentially yeah, what yeah. he was showing, right? And cool. and so he was sort of entrepreneurial in that way. And he essentially made his living that way, sort of demonstrating this. And he got the urine, he collected it from a from the beer drinking German soldiers. What? How much did he need? Why did lots, he just use lots, his own many, urine? Many, many barrels. Many, oh, many barrels and horses, okay. urine, and uh, you can imagine the mess. Um, that what it, an awkward question to go up asking people. I imagine, I mean, if someone comes up and asks for your urine and you're like, yeah, I guess. I'm not helps. doing anything with it, so yeah. you can go knock yourself out. Anyway, that's, that's the story of the discovery of phosphorus is Henning yeah. Brand. We just had the 300, two years ago. Around the time the book was being finished, we celebrated the 350th anniversary of that event. So it was really a long time ago. And like I said, the first chemical element that was pur- purified. And um, when did when did people start picking up on um, picking up on the um, the utility of of it with fertilizer? Way before that. 
probably, you know, his, they didn't know that it was phosphorus. Yeah. But yeah, many, right, many right. cultures, but, uh, right? They have been fertilizing for knew a long the, time, about but, fertilizer. They right. knew that bones were good. They knew that urine was good. They knew that manure was good. So there's all kinds of practices across many, many cultures, right? To maintain, um, you know, as agriculture sort of got rolling. Guano. To, um, you know, a lot of agriculture took place on floodplains, right? Which is a natural process by which the soils renewed with phosphorus and other nutrients. But hmm. in fixed agriculture uh, settings, you know, bird droppings and animal remains and whatever. And then I think the first sort of formal ways that fertilizer got going were in England, where they um, did experiments on these uh, experimental field stations and were starting to. Under, come to understand that there was something related to phosphorus that was essential for maintaining high yields. And uh, they did all kinds of crazy stuff. They used to bring mummies back from Egypt and turn them into fertilizer, which is one of the most bizarre and crazy things I've That's ever heard about. A priceless Yeah, a priceless mummy with yeah. huge archaeological and cultural <laughs> significance. There were so many mummies being robbed from Egypt by by uh, the United Kingdom or Britain at that time that um, they could just grind them up and turn them into fertilizer. They collected bones That's off the so of horses and soldiers off the fields of Waterloo and turned those into fertilizer. There's huh. a lot of, and then, you know, historically Soil speaking. Soil and green was people then. Could be. And then, there's, and then once, it, once it really got going, colonial um, development in the Pacific led to decimation of cultures so the, on the fertilizer islands like Nauru Island. Tragic um, events there. Those, those islands were absolutely stripped to the waterline um, uh, of phosphate. I'm not familiar. Yeah, Nairu Island and some other islands out in the Southeast Pacific are, um, uh, have phosphate deposits from ancient uh, bird accumulations that have been lithified, turned into rock and such, and accumulated. And, you know, of course, people were living there and, and had their um, own cultures and such. And then, of course, they were discovered by um, colonial uh, colonizers and um, and then the British we'll and that. others swept in and um, and uh, mined them to the pretty much down to the like I said to the waterline. Wow. A lot of them was brought to Australia for fertilizer at that time and elsewhere. Um, so um, that's the more recent historical source of fertilizers. Those have mostly been mined out, and now yeah, it's Morocco, it's Florida, it's uh, China. Um, places still have. Um, access to geological phosphate rock. So this has already been a this has already been a a, um, a resource that has been fought over and and people have gone to great lengths for in the past. When uh, when in kind of recent history has it started um, uh, becoming becoming an issue that say scientists or politicians or policy yeah makers or well i mean people, you know agronomists agronomists and you know um plant scientists of course for a long time have spent a lot of time on phosphorus developing their you know what are the requirements for phosphorus fertilizer how does it behave in soil how do we you know apply it um the Tennessee Valley Authority developed fertilizer research centers, right, for developing phosphorus. The Green Revolution is rests one of the. There's three legs of the Green Revolution. One is improved crop varieties, high yield high yield crops. That's what Norman Borlaug wrote, won the Nobel Prize for. Um, the second tool leg of that of the Green Revolution is irrigated agriculture and expand and water availability, expanding um, arable land. And the third leg is fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And so, um, so a lot of work has gone into determining, you know, what fertilizer use practices, crop um, availability, soil processing. So that's that side. So that and that side's always sort of gone on its own. On the other side of the equation has been um, the pollution side. Mm. And that's sort of where I come into, have come into it. That's where I entered this whole thing. And, you know, Shane, you're probably aware, right, that phosphorus pollution from sewage has been a huge problem in a lot of places for a long time, driving algae blooms and 
cyanobacteria and fish kills, et cetera. And so we got a hold of that in a lot, most of the developed world, at least, um, in terms of wastewater treatment. So now we have advanced wastewater treatment plants that can take sewage and treat it, not just to get rid of the poop and the organic matter that's present, that's primary treatment, but to go all the way to tertiary treatment where they take the phosphate out and they precipitate it out chemically or remove it biologically, and then that gets into a landfill and kept out of the water system. So that solved a lot of problems. In fact, you know that was one of Lake Erie's biggest problems for a long time was uh, all the sewage input from all the big cities along uh, causing algae blooms like Michigan, the same story, et cetera. Um, generally was pretty well solved um, in Europe as well, a lot of this in mm. other areas. But that is in the more recently transitioned to a non-point source diffuse pollution situation with phosphorus that's coming from agriculture. What's, and, what's the, what do those terms mean? Diffuse or non-point source. A point source is something that comes out of a pipe. Right. Like a sewage outfall or something like that right, or, right. Uh, for an industry outfall. Non-point source is stuff where it's not clear where it's coming from. It's coming in runoff. It's coming in right. groundwater flow. It's coming from a lot of different places. Um, and so agricultural loss of nutrients from and phosphorus and nitrogen from agricultural fields, from croplands, is a form of non-point source pollution. That's been increasing because, you know, cropping has increased and farmland has increased and fertilizer applications have been increasing. And then also because of um, meat production and dairy, intensive dairy land uh, production and, and uh, animal uh, raising. Um, mm -hmm. And that's now what's causing the new problem, many of the new problems that Lake Erie's having, for example, it, Lake Erie's having big problems with um, algae blooms that had gone away for a while. And now it's mostly driven by the agricultural equation so so first a lot of the emphasis was okay you have the the population is kind of exploding uh through time how do you feed all these people and a lot of the efforts put into squeezing as many crops out of say acre of land as as possible in the most efficient way and then you make a bunch of advances that way and then you go oh i guess there's no free lunch and you have pollution and runoff and all of these issues that are now I, I think I think that's uh I think one of the one of the trickiest things about that issue to me seems to be that it's not um it's not as kind of salient and sellable to uh the, the general public where everyone understands the need to eat um right. I, I feel like not everyone understands the need to mitigate runoff from farmland so it doesn't yeah that's right i mean you know later. i think the, there's a disconnect between well you know we need drinking water right mm -hmm. so the city of toledo had no drinking water for about a week because of a toxic algae bloom in lake erie because they draw their water from lake erie there's a city right. in china that lost the city of five million i believe that lost wow. its drinking water supply wow. for a week um, because of a toxic algae bloom. Algae, yeah, so dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. We just had another uh, big red tide that was just occurred in California in the San Francisco Bay um, just week before last. So, um, and there actually has learned that all around San Francisco Bay, um, the cities don't do tertiary wastewater treatment. And mm. I was just shocked by that because, like, this is one of the most affluent developed areas of the United States and how can they not be doing advanced wastewater treatment, but they're not, they're just putting it in. Oh, the bay is pretty big. It's going to go out through the ocean. It's not going to matter. Right. But they're learning that it does matter still. Um, yeah. So those are disconnect, right? So the dis disconnect. So phosphorus is over here, essential for food production. Phosphorus is essential uh, or is a main driver of water pollution. And those two worlds don't come together very much. And that's one thing I've been doing is the last, 10 years or so is trying to bring those two things together. Yeah. Because there's a lot of blame and a lot of uh, finger pointing that goes on and a lot of ignoring that goes on as well, where, you know, those on the side of food production and feed the world seem to forget that they're also obligated to protect the water. Right, <laughs> right. Right. And those on the water protection side are 
sometimes it's easy to forget that, yeah, we got to grow a lot of food because there's hungry right. people out there. On the other hand, a lot of those arguments lose their salience when we realize how much food or how much fertilizer and how much agriculture goes into things other than feeding people. Right. <laughs> right. So we say, oh, feed the people. But why is, you know, uh, why do we waste so much food? 30 yeah. to 40 percent of food is wasted um, globally in all kinds of situations. If we didn't 30, waste, 30 to 40 yes. percent global, there, there has to be. There has to be a, there, is there a dramatic difference between developed nations and no? That percentage is the same. It's just that the waste occurs at a different place. I see. In the in uh, less developed countries, the the loss of food occurs at the field level because crops don't get harvested in time, or they're stored in places where pests get to them, mm -hmm. or the cold chain is not operating properly, can't get things to market in time. Um, and they lose things um, more further up the supply chain. In developed countries, more economically um, prosperous countries, we lose food at the household level. We lose it at the retail level. We lose it for cosmetic reasons. It looks funny. Or mm. um, it's you know past an arbitrary date of some kind. Or people buy too much or whatever. So we lose it down that end. And in other areas, they lose it more on the supply end. So that's one place. Another place, of course, is a lot of fertilizer goes into growing crops that are used to grow food for animals that then we then eat. <laughs> right? right. And so um, remarkable amounts. Right. Um, and so that's another issue. Right. So where, how far, how high in the food chain are people eating to get their calories and protein? Um, and so, um, so in you know, a lot of places, people like their hamburgers. And so they're in cows are just a terribly inefficient way to get calories and protein to people because right. the, you have to feed them 10 or 20 times more food than they produce in new meat. Right. And right, so right. all of that soybean, all of that corn, all of that other uh, feed um, has to be grown. And they just to produce, you know, a little bit of, of beef. So yeah. that's one issue there in its own right. Um, so someone so, eating a cow is actually eating more soy, or consuming like more soy. At soy the end and of corn, the day yeah, absolutely, someone. yeah. So, um, so how much meat is in your diet? What kind of meat is in our pro issue um, there? And then, of course, there's also source. We also grow a lot of corn in the United States for ethanol <laughs> um, or biofuels, and um, that's not feeding any people. <laughs> Um, so, um, so those food system issues are ones that, um, also need to be addressed. So that's one side of the coin is like, how can we make the food system actually be directed toward producing abundant, healthy, nutritious food for people? Um, and the other side is like, what's happening? How do we use fertilizer in the, in the agricultural system to be more efficient? Can we get crops that are Better at better at using for phosphorus. So we don't need so much fertilizer. So that people are working on that. In the past, we've just done just assumed. Oh yeah, we've plenty of fertilizer. Just put it out there, right? And we've made in the book we call them uh, lazy uh, lazy plants. They're sort of lazy. They don't spend a lot of effort, if you will, <laughs> trying to go get phosphorus because we're always just putting so much in the soil. But if we bred them or raised them or selected for crops that are more efficient at gathering nutrients from soil, we wouldn't need to put so much fertilizer on in the first place. So that's part of it. And then the so, other side of what, you know, needs to be done or people are working on is the whole, this whole, we don't have a circular economy for phosphorus. We have a, we call it a, we really have a, a um, conveyor belt mostly mm -hmm. there's not a lot of loops in it and circles in it. we dig it up in the mines we turn it into fertilizer we put that on fields a lot of it is lost at that stage it goes into a food system we poop it out or some our cow poops it out it goes Washed downstream yeah. and sayonara <laughs> no <laughs> so. well well because i i do and i i almost stopped in the beginning just to um just to clarify a little bit, because uh, because you, you know you had made the point that um, phosphate isn't going anywhere. It's uh, that that it, it's it's not like fuel. It doesn't it doesn't burn off. But the actual process of collecting it will continue to get 
more and more difficult, right? And 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 I, I, there there has been some debate about peak phosphorus and how long we're going to have phosphorus lasting. Yeah, so are those convers those that the conversation has moved along since those original concerns were raised. I mean, I think one thing has changed is that people have developed a different, a better idea about what phosphate rock reserves means, like what that actually is, and then. And then there have been some revisions about the availability of phosphate rock reserves. So those numbers have been adjusted by new studies. I mean, it's sort of a good news, bad news sort of story. The good news is we have more phosphate rock than we thought before. Mm-hmm. But the maybe less than good news, but it's not necessarily really bad news, is that Morocco has all of it. Mm-hmm. So Morocco is a friendly country. Um, they're open to trade, they're, um, et cetera. So um so right now there's no problems with phosphate rock, is, but you know phosphate's in charge, going to be in charge of the phosphorus cycle going forward unless other things happen. Um, so um, and the other bad news part of that is that there's way more phosphorus out there. There's plenty of phosphorus to completely deoxygenate the oceans if we really wanted to, or if we didn't, mm-hmm. we weren't care if we just mobilized it all, put it all into circulation in the next uh, century. There's enough phosphate out there and the calc and geochemists have calculated it'll eventually go in the ocean over hundreds of years right. and it'll be enough to drive pretty much the entire ocean to anoxia and that mm. is not something anyone wants to see so yeah. the point is to keep the phosphorus cycle smaller all right reduce the scope of it circularize it make it more efficient right and keep mm. and, and stop losing so much out to the greater environment well, I, I would, I'd like to kind of go back to some of this disconnect and, and then, um, and uh, I, I guess first I'd, I'd need to know about some of the solutions. So say, say you're uh, a farmer in Wisconsin near where I grew up or something and, and you're fertilizing your land. You hear about this, uh, you hear this episode and you're like, my God, I'm going to, or probably, probably more likely the government has intervened in some way. Um, but, but the, the, the point is, is there, is there some sort of, um, uh, like irrigation, like collection process that, <laughs> uh, are there any kind of like filters that can be put on the edge of farmland? <laughs> well, or anything yes that and no, uh, no, they're not. Um, there's edge of field stuff that people do just trying to trap phosphorus before it gets out. So people build, you know, wet, you know, retain borders on their field so they'll put you know mini wetlands in to try to intercept stuff that doesn't help you get it back um necessarily or get it back in the circulation um there are people right now trying or at least thinking about devices or technology to put on tile drains so you're probably aware that there's a lot of agriculture that runs by tile drains which are pipes put in underneath the field or the pull the water off so that you can crop um plant your crops uh, earlier. Um, and, but that process problem with tile drains is really, really is an efficient way to get the phosphorus out of the field and into the water column, <laughs> into the streams and such. So people are thinking about, okay, is there a technology we could add to the tile drain to either to intercept the phosphorus and at least keep it out of the rivers and such, or maybe even recycle it, right? Um, so farmers, what should they be doing? There's lots of good advice out there about fertilizer and how to use it uh, to apply the right kind of fertilizer for your crop, to apply it at the right time, um, to write the right form um, of phosphorus and fertilizer and the right put it in the right place with respect to the rooting zones of your crops. So that's a good thing. And a lot of uh, farmers will do that. Uh, an issue, of course, with that, though, is that like all nutrient management in the United States is all voluntary. So, right. Um, so there's no legal requirement that anyone do anything. So these practices are adopted voluntarily. Often they'll have to be financial incentives in, uh, put in place. And so essentially the government is paying um, farmers to do conservation agriculture or no-till or uh, one thing or the other. Right. I mean, well, outside of in unless, you know, there's best practices that are making, you know, their – uh, building efficiencies that's uh, that's allowing for them to say spend less on fertilizer or get more yield or something like that. It, it is it you know I care about the environment. I have you. I, I have other scientists on talking about environmental issues. 
all of the time. I, I certainly uh, tend to vote to, for uh, policymakers that hopefully care more about environmental issues than others. Um, but I've never been asked to, you know, say there say there's new fancy filters or whatever else put in in these um, in these houses or drains or or whatever for farmers that they can implement, and they're two hundred thousand dollars to put in or or it, whatever. I've I've never been asked to fork over like eighty thousand dollars <laughs> for the environment in a year. You know, so yeah. It, and, and, and it, se- it seems like just a tricky situation. It is a tricky situation, a um, you know, but, you know, as you know, the reason it's all voluntary is because agriculture is exempt from the Clean Water Act. And mm. so, um, so. That's if you interesting. Were a, I, did, I actually didn't know that. Yes. So if you were a factory, right, and you were emitting something out of your operation into the river that was harming fish or harming downstream ecosystems, you would be subject to Clean Water Act and you would be required to stop that emission, mitigate it, et cetera. And it probably would cost you money, (laughs) right, to implement whatever technologies and changes to your operations to prevent that. And then you would pass that cost on to the consumer, right, in the cost of the good, right? And so that's how it sort of comes into the equation. Agriculture is not subjected to that. Presumably, if they were, and this is, of course, a very dangerous thing to say, so I'm luckily, you know, Wisconsin, unknown, unknown location here. <laughs> if agriculture were subject to the Clean Water Act, that would be an enormous political um, move. Uh, yeah. But th- that's essentially what would start to happen. You would have to have monitoring of emissions of nutrients from agricultural uh, locations and farms, and you would have to then be penalizing farmers for. Um, for that don't meet those guidelines or limits and then to respond they would maybe have to implement more expensive um, technologies or approaches or be satisfied with lower yields or other sorts of things right and then that would presumably also be reflected in what they sell their crops for um, and it would enter um, the market or the economy that way and you know eventually it show up in higher food prices right eventually it would show up usually we and the general population that's benefiting from agricultural production would eventually pay for it in the form of uh, at the grocery store. Um, on the other hand, we're paying for it otherwise <laughs> when right. um, uh, there's fish kills and uh, recreational degradation of ecosystems um, or the shrimp farmer in Gulf of Mexico can't catch so many shrimp because of the dead zone, then we pay more for shrimp, um, et cetera. Right. So the question is where in the system is it should we be paying where is it fair who should be paying um, but right now a lot of the situation is that we're in is because agriculture is exempt from the clean water act yeah i mean i i would i would think that i would think that it's something that so so my if i was if i was some political advisor or something with with my now um our almost of having thought about this in my almost no information. I, I would say that, you know, old McDonald doesn't really exist the way that it still did when I was uh, a kid. And a lot of these industrial uh, farming operations aren't overly popular within um, the public anyway. And there, I, I would imagine the major contributors and also have the the most amount of money to implement and and adhere to um, clean water uh, things, and also I think you could also make a, a case that that you know if you're if you're endangering shrimp and oceanic life and 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 fishermen, which are a lot more like small businesses than a lot of these industrial farmers, as opposed to cranking out more corn or whatever else, it's a, I, I think it could be made made clear to people that that there's uh, I, I think you could make a case that you'd be <laughs> we're uh, treading uh, in deep and dangerous waters uh, but yeah um i can see all of that yeah i mean i think you know um public understanding of what farming is all about these days is you know maybe a little yeah if you think it's you know old mcdonald far uh, and- i mean just say the word monsanto uh, no no one wants no one's on monsanto no one's a monsanto fan you know that's uh, it's uh, the industrial farming has gotten 
so unpopular lately and and you know there's a zillion documentaries like food inc and whatever else and i i think some of those are overblown and who knows whatever else but it does seem like it's getting out to the public that that a lot of these practices yeah that a lot of things need to might they need to change in the food system with respect yeah. to how farms operate yeah right um yeah there's a lot of other things going on i think you know maybe you're you know, listeners might be interested in other things that are happening sure. to solve to solve problems. There are recycling, um, phosphorus recycling technologies emerging, some of which are becoming reasonably popular, operating in wastewater treatment plants, for example, trapping phosphate out of of human waste and turning it into fertilizer. That's going on. Of course, that's the only small part of the equation. Most of the f- like fertilizer phosphorus is in the food system is lost well before it gets to the dinner plate and therefore to the toilet. Um, so like manures where the action is for phosphorus because of mm-hmm. how much livestock is being raised. I th- saw recently a calculation by folks at Iowa State University or University of Iowa that if you add up all the pigs and uh, cows and other livestock in the state of Iowa and convert their excretion into human equivalents, uh, how much phosphorus that a uh, human excretes, right? You can turn a pig's excretion into equivalent amount of how many people that represents. The state of Iowa has a po- equivalent population of about 200 million people. Mm. That's how wow. much phosphorus it's excreting is being excreted by its livestock. It's as if they had a population of 200 million people. Now, if they had a population of 200 million people, of actual people, those all those people would be on wastewater treatment plants. Right. Right, right. Those pigs are not, and those cows are not on wastewater treatment plants. They're putting out manure and other uh, excretion, at, uh, and it's being spread. It's being distributed. It is uh, making big problems in the state of Iowa. So huh. um, that's a big source of that needs to be solved. Um, there are things like uh, bioreactors where people gather the manure and turn it into bioenergy and hopefully get the nutrients out. Um, that may or may not be um, the way forward, but it's something that people are working on. Um, another really cool thing that's as we discuss in the book that, that actually I tell people that in that book, these were the pages I had to revise most frequently as the book got to completion. And those are the uh, stuff that deals with cellular agriculture and you know, stem cell meat. So this is a really uh, interesting, rapidly expanding uh, technology, whether it's going to be a solution at scale is another question. But now they can take the stem cells from a cow. You know, a stem cell is a undifferentiated cell that can over divide and become a specialized tissue type over time. They're able to grow stem cells of cows in vats and grow them and make uh, meat. With yeah, that. And it's amazing. now for beef, there's chicken, there's fish, there's all kinds of things emerging. There's stem cell milk that is being developed. Um, how really how far along is that? Is it's, it can, it's can I pretty, buy some? Um, um, I yeah, it's pretty close. Um, is there so yeah, in Singapore, they've licensed um, the first uh, chicken wow. to be sold commercially. And well, I've been talking, I mean, that's solving a lot of things. That's solving moral dilemmas, environmental yes. ones. There's yes, it's a, a big deal. I think it's on. a big deal. Um, that is a huge deal. It's a big deal. And I asked, I was speaking to someone who runs a venture capital firm um, for the, some of these companies. Um, and I asked them, all right, so, you know, this looks like it's moving pretty fast. How soon will I get this in the grocery store? And he said, five years. Five years. That's pretty quick. What do you, do you think? He's optimistic there? I don't know. He's going to, we're having an event coming up in a few weeks and this guy's going to be there. So I'm going to pin him down and, <laughs> and not really huh. grill him a little harder. Well, that would, that would really be something. The interesting thing is that, you know, I contacted him sort of, you know, as I found out what they were doing and I told him, hey, you know, what about phosphorus? And he was like, well, what's phosphorus? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was another one because they were selling, you know, their technology based on the, the humanity uh, ethical aspects, but right. also the climate change and carbon sort of equation and nutrient management, nutrient pollution wasn't on their minds. And I'm like, let me tell you something, friend. <laughs> Here's another, you know, sales point for your technology right. is like this is going to mitigate a lot of phosphor, uh, the nutrient pollution issues because a lot of it's driven by livestock raising 
And I asked him, where did your phosphorus come from? He didn't know. Yeah. Wow. So it's again, it's sort of like, yeah, you got phosphorus in your technology and in your process and your product, but you don't know, you don't know about it. But I wonder what the, oh, it, it, you would, you would think just intuitively, I would, I would think it'd be very efficient, right? That, I like I, it because, you know, you're putting it in there and, you know, you know, what's coming out and what you didn't, what was, you know, if, it, if like, let's say only 50% of your phosphorus you put in gets turned into the meat product, you still have it in the factory or whatever your, your facility is. Right. So you right. presumably can recycle it, get it right. going again. Right. And so to me, it's a, a wow. very pretty promising um, approach and we'll see. Um, how fast, but I also tell people, do you, how much would it have cost you to buy the first stem cell hamburger? Right. And the answer to that question is $850,000 <laughs> because it was financed by Sergey Brin, who was one of the founders of Google. He, he started this process and they essentially hired about, you know, a couple dozen or a few dozen doctoral level cell, you know, molecular yeah. biologists, food scientists to develop this over the course of five or seven, 10 years. So if you add all that up, it was like almost a million dollars or half a million dollars to make that first quarter pound. Did he get to, did he get to He have did a bite? not get to, to eat it. Um, That's he, amazing. They, they had a taste <laughs> test. They had a taste test. They a got some food uh, professionals in. Yeah. And I think they gave it a sort of a C plus. Um, C plus is he, not bad for a first one. Yeah, but the C cool plus? thing is, yeah, the cool That's thing is, most is in that school. if you did that burger today, the answer is it would cost you $8.50. Re uh, wait, so how long ago was this again? The The million dollar one? Um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So 10, 10 years later. So wow, it's, 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 on, hopefully it's undergoing Moore's law, right? So hopefully the price is just dropping precipitously and that 850 is, uh, that's about four year old, four years ago. So I think now it's getting to be competitively priced. And so, um, so look for that on, um, on the horizon. Wow. <laughs> that's really that. Well, that's exciting. I was, I was. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's that makes me. That's an uplifting part of of this episode. I I would say that uh, out of everything that we've talked about, that's the that's the thing where I'm like, that could work. That could do it. That I think it's really pretty. Pro I think what not, yeah. So ever say, well, why don't you become a vegetarian? I'm not a vegetarian. I do try yeah, to reduce me my meat there, intake. But I, 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 if, if if if, if solving this problem requires everyone on Earth to become a vegetarian. We're not going to solve this problem. Yeah. Because it's in time. Just it's not going to happen. So it's yeah. not a realistic goal. I think it's great right. to have a goal of reducing meat intake generally yeah. and reducing the amount of beef and other more intensive meats that we consume. That's yeah, we talked goal. about having like no meat Mondays, you know, for yeah. people and things like I, that. I was thinking about my diet over the past weekend. I had no meat this weekend. Oh, that's great. But it, you know, depends on what we cooked and what happened and where I'm going and what's happening in my weekend. But you know, mm -hmm. semitarian. How about that? Why don't we just all become semitarians? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I mean, then you'll get pushback from people that now need to like advertise just how much steak they can have to fight against the. Yeah. Weak soy boys that are eating, <laughs> and they don't realize they're actually eating, going through more soy themselves. Um, so yeah, I, d I don't have a, I don't have a whole lot of hope for p changing people's diets. I'm talking as someone who would have a hard time changing his. Um, even though I've been to amazing vegan restaurants that are that I've had a lot better meals. Yeah, I think the cultural than, shift that is being called for is too large to address the problem in this, this the speed that's needed. So But but what about what about other uh reduction issues? So so because we've talked about these large scale things and and potential policy change and um in industry changes is is there anything other than just dietary changes that a, food waste a is a low hanging fruit F food waste is a oh, okay. mostly a process level interview like you don't have to like split the atom or you know do something really crazy to it's sort of an infrastructure problem it's a attitude problem so food waste seems to me to be a good uh target for you know it's a pretty big number right 30 percent right? right so if you can get that number to 10 percent 
the impact on the food system would be quite large. And so a lot of those are going to be, again, consumer attitude. Um, it's going to be commercial practice. Um, I just saw something, heard about something recently, DoorDash for food waste. Sort of like there's, I think it was in San Francisco or someplace typical, right? Is that there's a, uh, you know, um, entrepreneur, you know, a, a philanthropic entrepreneur, right? Or uh, whatever they call the folks who are entrepreneurs, but they don't want to make a lot of money. Um, but they've invented an app essentially where restaurants will, or grocers, I guess, will call up and, you know, go on the app and I've got 10 meals or 10 servings of X. And so a volunteer who is monitoring the app will say, okay, I'm coming. And they pick it up and they drive it somewhere where someone's mm -hmm. going to eat it. Um, so that kind of thing. And then just imagine an approach cool. like that that moves sort of down up the supply chain, right, where it's operating maybe among retailers. Maybe it's operating among uh, in food wholesalers. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe we can make that kind of intervention to reduce food waste. And then, of course, in the household, right, people are doing all kinds of things that aren't necessarily, you know, rational, right? So why are we throwing out so much stuff? Is, you know, just cut that end, cut that dirty end, though, or cut that end of the banana off and eat the other end, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, all these things that we do because we're a little more fastidious than we need to be with, um, with our... Uh, Food. Yeah, a lot of the a lot a lot of those expiration dates on non perishable. There, yeah, items. in the book we actually talk about expiration dates. To, you know, we use by best after or before or whatever. Right? It's like, what do they mean? I think yeah. in the book I go into my refrigerator and actually pull out all the stuff in there and start reading off what they're saying. And it's like it's very um, unorganized and unstructured in parts of Europe, they do that better, um, than we do in the United States. And so, yeah, looking at what those things, I think how, it's more how? regularized, the communication that comes from the, um, agencies and the uh, government about what hmm. you have to label the food as for their, for, for its expiration. Hmm. So they're just making crap up here. They're just, stuff. yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. <laughs> I really thought so. Like no one, no one's getting in there. There's no regulatory. Well, there the, is, the, but the, it's the sort FDA of it's pretty squishy about what they all mean, and it's not. Huh. I don't think it's very effectively communicated to a consumer about what the use by thing means. It doesn't mean that you're going to be killed if you eat it on the following day, hmm. <laughs> right? It's best before, right? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> right right huh it's interesting um all right well was there is there anything else kind of in the future that you're um that you're looking forward to seeing that that or or if you were you know given the opportunity to plead a case to congress or <laughs> Senate or something like that. And, and, well, I mean, and I think we talked about it awareness. already. I mean, I think agriculture should be brought under the uh, provisions of the Clean Water Act. Right. Um, I think that that's political suicide in many parts of the country. Um, so Is there anyone proposing anything like that on a political level? Uh, uh, no. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> Yeah. So, huh. um, so, yeah, so we have to work within what we have. I mean, you know, a lot of these things are, you know, will get rolling when they become um, economically uh, viable. I mean, it's like, you know, photovoltaics and solar energy now. It's so damn cheap right now to buy electricity from solar sources that they're just going to, they're just going to start taking over, right? Because it's just cheap, right? Mm -hmm. Um so why wouldn't you source your energy from solar sources? Because <laughs> it's so cheap, right? So hopefully it starts becoming the same. Uh, the uh, recycled fertilizers are still a long way off. Um, um, phosphate rock-based fertilizers are still very, they're very relatively low, unexpensive, even though this year they've increased by, they've doubled in price. Um, so that's going to take a little more, that, that would require intervention. It would require government uh, ser um, uh, tariffs or surcharges on industrial phosphate rock fertilizer to make the recycled ones more uh, affordable or competitive or a, or a subsidy for the recycled companies, the companies that are making recycled fertilizers um, to make them 
But on the other hand, you know, the whole agricultural system is very vertically integrated from, so it's hard for any sort of new products to make it into that supply chain. Um, what else? Um, awareness. You know, I just, you know, this whole concept, right, is that phosphorus, right, is so important and people just, they have passing knowledge, right, that there's something important about it. Oh, yeah, it's in my fertilizer bag that's in my garage, and that's about all they get. Do you have, do you have anything, you, you meet someone at, at some uh, gathering, a dinner party or something like that, some new person, they ask you what you do. And you tell them you have this book, Phosphorus. Do you do you have any uh, do you, do you have any like the, the conversation topic? Do you, do you have a, a fun fact or something like well, that? You, that's I always will a start hit? with that. How much phosphorus is in your body right now? Pound I, and Jed, a half. That is, that's how the book starts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, um, people do eyes do sort of open a little bit and they say, what are you talking about, man? Yeah. Um, so that's where. Yeah. So uh, usually I like to have you know conversations that last more than 30 seconds at a cocktail party. So I won't start with sure. phosphorus when I'm chatting with someone. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I can call. go on at length about this. And we've been going <laughs> sure. on ourselves for about an hour now. So um, yeah. so I can go on. But yeah, for me, it's like for people just to realize that there's this thing element that just is so central to being alive Mm -hmm. and so central to ecological systems and to water and to everything on earth and um they should you know invest a little time to learn about it and um and find out how to be more careful about it fantastic uh guys if you got if you want to learn more check out the book phosphorus uh, past and future available and, at Oxford University Press or at Amazon on, on Kindle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, oh shoot, what's your what's your co-author's name again? Phil Hagerth. Phil Hagerth. Um, and and thank you, Jim Elser, for joining me again. Why don't you tell people your Twitter handle too? Because I, if you if you like um kind of just environmental science uh things generally jim has a lot of good stuff he puts out sure my twitter handle is at dr dr limnology l-i-m-n-o-l-o-g-y and limnology is a study of inland waters <laughs> nice uh or you can just you can go and click on my list of here we are guests and uh and he'll pop up in the feed I post pretty regularly so uh, thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. It's good catching up with you again. Congrats Great, on the Shane. Book. It was a pleasure to, to talk phosphorus with you. Absolutely. And thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next week. <laughs>